I've been getting a lot of requests recently to tackle the problem of the compound pendulum and I thought in particular since the double pendulum problem seems to have garnered so much attention that we would look at a double compound pendulum. And more to the point, when looking back at some of the other videos, I have concerns that I haven't really set out a step-by-step -step methodology for you guys to follow to allow you to tackle more complicated problems. So this video has a dual purpose. One is to address the problem of the double compound pendulum, but also in doing so to set out a step-by-step -step methodology that I think you ought to follow in tackling problems of this nature, and that will allow you to tackle even more complicated problems far more easily. So to make this problem a little bit more interesting, a torsional spring has been included at the hinge between the two masses. In addition, an external moment, M of T, is applied at the first hinge point. Each of the masses are rods. Rod number one can assume to be of a length L1 and have a mass M1 and have a rotatory moment of inertia J1. Similarly, the second mass has length L2, mass M2, and rotatory inertia J2. Due to the geometry of the problem and the fact that each mass is a rod, we can use the formula for the rotatory moment of inertia for a rod. J1 is equal to M1 L1 squared divided by 12. And similarly, J2 is equal to M2 L2 squared divided by 12. In order to use the method of Lagrange's equations, we are required to find the kinetic and potential energies of the system. We'll start off by finding the kinetic energy T. T is equal to the kinetic energy of each of the masses. So looking first at the translational kinetic energy, that is one half m1 times the velocity of mass one squared, which can be written x1 dot squared plus y1 dot squared. Plus from mass number two, one half m2 times x2 dot squared plus y2 dot squared. And then we've got to include the rotatory kinetic energy of each of the masses. That is one half j1 theta one dot squared plus one half j2 theta two dot squared. That's as easy as can be. The only difference here, of course, is we're including the rotatory kinetic energy now. Moving on to the potential energy V, V is equal to mgh for each of the masses. So m1, g1, y1, where y1 is the location, the height of the center of gravity. I remind you that in the case of the rod, the center of gravity is at the midway point, at L over 2. Okay, and similarly we add M1 G, M1 G Y2. And then in order to account for the spring, 1 half K sub T times the displacement theta 2 minus theta 1 squared. Let's give these some numbers. Number 1, number 2, put a couple of boxes. All right, I'm going to try and keep this all on the same page, just so you can see it all at one time. So in all of these problems, the idea is we've got to find the kinetic and potential energy. And we proceed using what I would refer to as the kinematics, where we're actually applying the constraints of this problem. So what does that mean in English? That means, why don't we locate the center of gravity of each of the masses? And we look at mass number one, we can see that mass number one, the x coordinate is just this position here. It's L1 divided by two times sine of theta. Okay, and similarly, the y coordinate is L1 divided by two cosine of theta, but it's in the negative direction, right? Because y is positive upwards. And then for mass two, we recognize that we've got to get all the way out here, and then it's a distance from there. So how do we do this? We first locate the hinge. x2 is equal to L1 sine of theta 1 plus L over 2 sine of theta 2. And then similarly for the y, the y location, y2 is equal to minus L cosine theta 1, minus L1 I should say, cosine theta 1, minus L2 over 2 cosine of theta 2. Now, in addition to the location, we need the velocities. The velocities we can find very easily by taking the time derivative of each of these locations. So we'll do it one by one in component form. x1 dot is just a constant time sine of theta 1. So it's L over 2, oops, L over L1 over 2, theta 1 dot times cosine of theta 1. And similarly, 
the negatives cancel, so y1 dots is equal to L1 over 2 theta 1 dots sine of theta 1. The negative goes away because the derivative of cosine is minus sine. So for x2 dot, similarly we take the derivative of x2 and it's L1 theta 1 dot cosine of theta 1 plus 1 half L2 theta 2 dot cosine of theta 2. Differentiating y2 dot gives us the negatives cancel, so L1 theta 1 dot sine of theta 1, because cosine of theta 1 gives us minus sine of theta 1, and plus 1 half L2 theta 2 dot sine of theta 2. Mm, let's give these some numbers, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Okay, and really we're done at this point. I'm going to leave it as an exercise to you to substitute these velocities and these positions now into T and V and then crank it through Lagrange's equations and come up with the equations of motion. It's really just a little bit of tedious algebra at this point. I should also mention that the external moment here will appear in the first equation of motion, the equation for theta 1, on the right hand side. It will be the forcing function for that equation. That will come out of Lagrange's equations. And just to recap, what do we do? We write an expression for the kinetic and potential energies. We find that the kinetic and potential energies are a function of the location of the masses and also a function of the velocities, obviously. And we do that just by going back to fundamental principles. We locate the mass within our coordinate system. We take the derivatives to get the velocities. We plug all of this in here. Now you can see when I take y2 dot and I plug it in here and square it, it's going to get a little bit messy. So I don't think there's a lot to be gained from just cranking the algebra for the remainder of this video. I'm going to leave it in this form because I hope that really what you get out of this video is how to systematically tackle problems like this and uh, showing that these problems are not that difficult when you just go through them logically. And I've shown this in numerous previous videos. If any of you really need a video on this, then let me know and I guess I'll make a part two, a continuation to this. And I'm going to cut it off at this point. So thanks for watching. I hope you found something useful in this video. If you did, please go ahead and smash those like buttons. It gets other people to watch them too. If you have any questions, comments, problems, I'd love to hear from you in the comments section below. If you'd like to be notified of new videos as they come out, please subscribe to the channel and hit those bell buttons. Thank you for watching and I will catch up with you in the next video.